we had done all of that stuff going pulling up the rocks and doing all that fun stuff muddy I had that gross gross ditch slime all over me <laughs> we came up out of the ditch I gathered up all of the other dogs I put them on leash and chuckles walked home that day completely out of heel no new sandwich required and to this day Mark always loves it when I say this chuckles was one of our best pack walkers ever and it was all because of this final foundation of relationship block. We're talking about fulfillment. Let's get into Welcome it. Welcome to Beyond Obedience, the podcast, where we redefine dog companionship. Hi, I'm Tracy Franken, your guide to build a beautiful bond that transcends traditional training. Flip the script. This is where your dog is the true expert. For dog lovers who crave more than just a pocket full of treats, this is not your typical dog training podcast. This is Beyond Obedience. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Beyond Obedience, the podcast. My name is Tracy Franken of Beyond Obedience. This is podcast episode number five. I'm excited to be here. This is part three of our three-part series on the foundation of relationship framework. That's that incredible framework that I use that helps me live harmoniously with large groups of dogs without a lot of obedience and a lot of squabbles quite um quite well i've already said it harmoniously that's pretty much sums <laughs> that sums that up i don't know why i'm trying to reiterate that in any way but the point is is that uh, i don't require a lot of obedience to live with these dogs and again not that i'm saying there's anything wrong with obedience obedience is great however if you start to incorporate what I've been talking about in this framework, you're going to find that obedience, everything that you do with your dog gets easier. Everything gets easier. This foundation of relationship allows you to be somebody worth following. You don't have to worry about recall when you have a dog that wants to be with you. They want to hang out with you, no matter what's go what, whatever's going on, no matter whether or not there's other people, other dogs, squirrels, that kind of thing. You can build a relationship that's that tight with your dog when you understand and incorporate what I'm talking about in these foundational blocks. So let's recap very quickly. The first foundational block is leadership. Leadership in the form of guidance, right? Being a proper guide to, to your dog. What makes a great leader? It all, it all, in my opinion, stems down to trust. How do we build trust? You have to be reliable. You have to be dependable. You have to be predictable. You have to be calm in the face of all the things that life throws at you. And that's sometimes challenging for anybody. But that's what it takes to be a good leader. So leadership is that first block. Last week, we talked about this idea of relevance. What makes you relevant to your dog, right? It's more than just providing the essentials like food, water, shelter. It's how you provide those essentials. How are you feeding your dogs? Are you relating to your dogs? Is your dog a more dog-like dog? Are you living a more human-like existence? And if you are, how do you bridge that relevance gap? We talked about that last week. And today, here we are, the third and final block on that foundation of relationship, and that is fulfillment factor. Now, in the intro there, I was talking about a story about a beloved dog of ours, Chuckles. He is no longer with us, but I'll tell you, Chuckles wormed his way into my heart. Uh, my, my husband brought him home. I'll give you a little backstory on Chuckles. I know everybody thinks that I'm the reason why we ended up with 19 dogs, but I'll tell you, my husband's no better. Uh, <laughs> he, I might be the dog person, but he's no better. Uh, he brought Chuckles home one day, and he was like, I think we should keep him. And I'm like, really? I'm not? Okay, I'm going to preemptively say this. I'm not a hound person. Now, I love all dogs. I love all dogs. And I love the hounds for who they are. I think that they are brilliant. But they're just not my type of dog. And the reason for that is because I'm very, like, A-type when it comes to things. I, when I go for a walk, I like to, you know, straight line it, A to B, you know. <laughs> and when basset hounds or when beagles or hounds of any sort walk, they use their nose and they're all over the place. And I had spent some time in my early vet tech days rescuing research beagles, so I know 
what it's like to have the hounds. And I said to Mark, we don't really need a hound in our pack, right? At the time, we were using our, our Newfoundland dogs to help rehabilitate other dogs. We had some other dogs that were part of our daycare group. I'm like, what are we going to do with a basset hound? Because that's what Chuckles was. He was this big, long, floppy-eared basset hound. And Mark's response to me was, I don't know, but he matches my truck. And I'm like, that's, that's not a reason to get a dog. Um, <laughs> But, of course, I could, you know, Mark's sad brown eyes were as, almost as sad as Chuckles' brown eyes. And before I knew it, Chuckles was part of our family. And he happened to come into our life at the exact same time that we had our three Newfoundland girl puppies. And they were all about the same age. And so I, you know, I looked at Chuckles and I was like, look at here, <laughs> learn to be a Newf. And I threw him in with the Newf puppies. <laughs> right? Which he loved. I mean, he grew up with those girls and he loved them. And, um, and, and just as I anticipated, just as I expected, Chuckles was a pain in the keister to walk, right? He was all over the place. His nose would take him everywhere and he would bounce off my leg and he would pull to the side and then he would go over here and he would stop and sniff and, and I was like, oh, come on, we want to keep going. And so I had come up with this very clever way to get Chuckles to <laughs> to walk and and that was uh, I used to sandwich him between two noofs so when we would go for walks I would walk him with a bunch of noofs and I would put him in the middle kind of like a um, Oreo cookie if you think of it that way he was the basset filling <laughs> to an Oreo cookie there were noofs on either side so what ended up happening because the noofs were great walkers they were very serious about their walk. When we're walking, we're walking. That's what we do, we walk, right? So when Chuckles was stuck in between two of them, he found himself unable to kind of, he bounced off the noose, but they wouldn't give him any leeway, and he would end up having to walk with the rest of the pack. And that worked splendidly. Except that there was always a part of our walk where we would give the noofs there what I used to call at liberty time. A little bit different than off leash because I left their equipment on and I would just tuck it into their collars and to that, that signaled to the dogs that they could actually have the freedom to kind of meander around, but I didn't want them running around and being all crazy. They still had to be paying attention and connected to me um, mentally, but they could go and do their own thing. Uh, so when Chuckles came into our lives, so I would get to that part of our walk where I would normally let all of the dogs go and do their at liberty work. And I looked at Chuckles and I'm like, oh, I guess I'm not going to be able to do that with you because you're a basset hound, right? If I let you go, you're just going to follow your nose. I'm never going to find you again. So for that part of the walk, I would just let him have the length of leash. And I mean, how many of us do that? I'm sure anybody listening is probably going to be like, yep, yeah, you know, that's, the, that's where I let the dogs just kind of do their own thing. So I let him have the length of the leash, wandering around, doing his thing, and I would just kind of walk beside, you know, on the road, and he would st I'd stop when he'd stop, and I'd just let him do his thing, and I was kind of in my own head. And then when it was time, I would call the rest of the noofs in, I'd gather everybody up, I'd stick him back in his noof sandwich, and we'd walk home. That was our walk for the longest time. And then one day, I'm out there, and I'm looking at Chuckles, and he was kind of kind of pulled a little bit to kind of go see something, and I'm like, I'm not going in there. Like, I, I, where are my running shoes, dude? I'm not going in there. It was all muddy. And I thought, you know what? I'm really not practicing what I preach. At the time, I would talk to people about this idea of, you know, allowing dogs to be themselves and be the person, or <laughs> be the person, be the dogs that they are and, and how valuable sniffing is and them being able to, to, uh, you know, explore their environment with their nose. And I'm like, I'm not really being fair to him. So I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to go. So I started following Chuckles. And at first he was kind of freaked out. I'm not going to lie, because I'd never done this before. So he kept looking behind him like, what's, why are you following me? Like, what's happening? But then he kind of got into it. because He's like, okay, we're going places. So there we were. I was following Chuckles. I let him do, like, wherever you go, buddy, I'm going to go. I followed him. And, uh, and he like took me into some pretty gross places. We were walking through the mud and then of course there was this ditch and you know in the ditch there was like like the gross slimy water. You know the green slimy water that is in the ditches. 
<laughs> you're like, I don't know what that is, but I don't want to touch it. He went in there, and I'm like, of course you went in there. Like, of course you went in there. But I'm like, all right, well, I'm doing this. So I'm rocking these shoes, and this is it. I'm doing this. So I followed him into the swampy, gross water, and then I got really involved in it. I was like, if he was sniffing a rock, I'd flip the, ra- the rock over, and, like, there was gross stuff on it, like bugs and stuff, and I would, like, kind of scream and go, like, ew, and then he would jump back, and then he'd jump forward, and we had a great, great time. Like, we were discussing it. We ended up having so much fun. Even the noofs came over to join, and I was like, oh, God, we're all going to be gross. <laughs> So we did this for a little bit, not that long, but we did this for a little bit. And then finally I was like, okay, we got to get, we got to get out of here. Cause I, my, my feet are soaked. I'm all muddy. This is disgusting. I should have wore boots. And, um, I, we got, we came out of the ditch. I called all the noofs over, uh, hucked everybody back up and much to my surprise. And it was much to my surprise. Chuckles walked perfectly beside me. No new sam- no new sandwich required, but it wasn't just that he walked beside me. That wasn't it. Because lots of people say, well, he was tired or he was, he, you know, he'd used his nose and that's very mentally exhausting. So he was probably tired and he walked beside you. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was a feeling that I had. Like he was actually like beside me. He would occasionally check in with me, look up at me. He was, but he was with me. I don't know if, I don't know if, if you know, I mean, if you know what I mean, like, tell me in the comments of this podcast, let me know, but he was with me, and I was like, holy moly, and so I kind of played around with it a little bit, so I would slow down, and he would slow down, and then I kind of speed up a little bit, and he sped up, like, he was so connected with me in that moment, and that's when it dawned on me, this idea of fulfillment, this idea of not just letting the dogs do what they want to do, giving them opportunities to do the things that they want to do, it's more than that. It's actually being a part of that fulfillment that is the magic of what happens there. That was the part that was so profoundly incredible. And here was the thing. It, it happened the next day. So the next day on our walk, I started the whole thing. I, I admittedly, out of habit, put him in between the two other noobs. Out of habit. Sheer habit. But I eventually was like, I don't even think you need this. And I kind of moved the noobs over. So it was just chuckles on my left and the noobs were on my right. And he walked beside me and he was kind of looking at me. Now he did pull a little bit, but he was pulling to get to the part of the road. It was called Mabel's Drive. Shout out to all my people who remember me from my, um, my arm prior days, <laughs> right? But uh, it was called Mabel Drive. And he knew that when we turned that corner off the main road and we went down Mabel Drive that we were going to get there. So there was a little bit of pulling to get to that place. And then the moment that we got there, I was like, I let the noobs go. And he was like excited. Like he was bouncing up and down and he jumped into the ditch. But this time he turned to look at me. Like he looked at me. And I was like, okay, hold on. I'm coming. I'm coming. Like it literally was a dog that was saying, are you coming? Let's do this thing again. So I was like, all right, let's do this. Now I was smarter this time. I wore rubber boots. Not long enough boots, I might add. They were just ankle boots, but they were better than wrecking my shoes. But I was in my rubber boots, and we went down, and we started doing the things, and we were looking at stuff. And, and you know, there was a couple of moments in it where he was like, he would kind of slip behind me, like, see what I would do. And I'm like, no, 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 you go. I don't know where you go. And he would get so excited, and his ears would get all goopy and dirty because we were, like, down and looking at things and sniffing things. And he was just so enthralled with the fact that I was interested in the things that he was doing. And so this lesson that Chuckle taught, that Chuckles taught me is something that I have been now talking so much about and it formulated this part of the foundation of relationship, this idea of fulfillment. Because what is fulfillment? Um, The feeling of happiness and satisfaction. It's the completion of something like the fulfillment of a promise. Um, of of meeting one's potential. Ooh, I like it. I like it. 
the happiness, essentially, it's the happiness that comes from meeting one's potential. You know, <coughs> quite often, if we were to look at our dogs, would you say your dog is meeting their full potential? <laughs> Many of our dogs, are they meeting their full potential? I mean, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know. I know Chuckles wasn't, right? When he was stuck on a leash, he wasn't meeting his full potential. So fulfillment factor is about not only finding ways to exercise the dog, right? There is a lot of, of um talk about this idea of exercising the dog, right? Making sure a tired dog is a good dog and exercising the dog. But here's the problem with that. If you exercise a dog, but the exercise that you give that dog is actually not part of their fulfillment, right? It's not, it's not encompassing that genetic desire, that that need that the dog has, right? Let's think about fulfillment too. Like, honest to God, lots of our dogs, fulfillment is in their breed description, right? Golden Retriever, Labrador Retriever, Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever. That dog, is its name is a resume, right? So for a lot of our working breeds, their, their fulfillment is in their genetic makeup. It's part of who they are. And so to allow those dogs to fulfill their potential, right, to realize happiness and joy because they are living up to their fullest potential requires them to be able to actually do the things that they are genetically programmed to do by not letting Chuckles use his nose. I was literally denying him that fulfillment. And here was the thing, and this is where a lot of us go wrong, because I hear lots of I hear lots of people say that, oh yeah, on the walk, I always give my dog time to do some sniffing. <clears throat> I always give my dog the opportunity to do some stuff and sniff and do some things. Here's the missed opportunity. You need to be a part of it. Can you be a part of that fulfillment? Can you actually be the reward that is involved in that fulfillment factor. Because if you can do that, and this is why I said fulfillment is like the trifecta of relationship. If you get fulfillment right, if you do it right, you can actually get leadership, relevance, and fulfillment all in one. So let me give you an example, right? Let's say uh, your dog is a retriever. Let's say your dog's favorite thing in the world is to play ball, right? They wanna fetch balls. They wanna, they wanna play that game. If, for example, all of the interactive toys that you have for your dogs, things that um, your dog retrieves, like tennis balls, frisbees, chuckets, um, whatever other th you know, throwing interactive toys you have, if for example, those toys are actually put away and they're not out all the time. They're put in a special bin and they are brought out only when you're like, hey, are you ready to play, right? You get that leadership point, right? This, this, I, this was your idea. You don't fall victim to what, many, what happens to many people, which is you're sitting doing something else, you're kind of preoccupied, the dog is is you know bumping your arm and putting a tennis a gross tennis ball on your lap or throwing a, a a gross rope on your lap and they're just nudging at you trying to get you to pay attention to them you're not really engaged you're not really invested in it you might half half ass sort of throw the ball across the room and just you know do that sort of thing and it's not you're not gaining any points there in fact you lost some points there because it was your dog's idea and you're not really involved you're not really there Right, but let's say you put all of those toys away. I'm not saying all the toys, I'm saying the interactive toys. Right, so the regular chew toys, the bones, the, you know, the stuffies, all of that stuff. Leave those out for your dogs to play so that they can self-soothe and they can entertain themselves when you're busy, obviously. But I'm talking about the interactive toys, the toys that involve you. Because here's my pro tip for you when it comes to fulfillment factor. The toys or the play, the joy has to and should come from you. 
the game should not be any fun without you. If you have a dog that's out there just grabbing its own toys, tossing them in the air, playing with them, shaking their own rope, and running around like banana beans by themselves, that's not about you. You got no points for that. You, 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 you're not there. You're not involved in that. That doesn't include you. The joy's coming from the toy, and if the joy comes from the toy, you're missing so many opportunities to bond and connect with your dog. So if you put those away, right, and you decide that now it's time to play, now you're engaged, now you're in it, now you're saying to the dog, you want to go play? And they're like, oh my gosh, it's playtime. And you go and you pick out them some toys and you're like, all right, let's go. And you go to the place where it's the play zone. We'll talk about that too if we're talking. For all of my people that are like, how do I keep my house calm? This is going to be one of them, <laughs> right? So we go to the designated place where it's about play and we start that game. Maybe it's a rousing game of tug. Maybe it's a game of fetch, whatever it is. But we start that game. We're like, let's go. We play it. And we're really in it. We're involved in it. We're a part of it. The dog is getting joy. The dog is spending time with you. You're 100% involved. You got some leadership points there because it was your idea. You're getting some relevance points there because, oh my gosh, you are engaging with the dog in a way that they want to play not in necessarily the way you want to do it, but the way they want to play. So you're gaining that relevance there, and it's part of their fulfillment factor. So it's the trifecta of relationship. You're getting leadership points, you're getting relevance, it's their fulfillment factor, so they're getting all of this good stuff. You become the reason and the reward in your dog's life. It is everything. Fulfillment is everything. And most people are missing the key components of it, right? Uh, what was that? Um, I don't remember what it was called, but at one point in time, and this was, you know, back before I understood all this stuff, I went out and I got one of those automatic ball thrower things because I had a ball-obsessed dog. She was um, like a husky mix, but uh, I was like, I'm going to get one of those ball things. And I thought it was kind of cool. It had a big old bucket on the top, and you just fill it full of tennis balls, and it made that noise, and it would shoot tennis balls out. And I did that for a while. And what I found was that um, the, the dog did it for a little bit, but then just was, became bored with it. Was like, mm, it's not really the same. Uh, she missed the fact that I wasn't there to delight in her playing with the toy, right? And I realized in that moment, I'm like, this toy isn't very fun for her because I'm not here, right? I'm not even a part of it. I was like, what a waste of money. <laughs> Right? So um, that's what I'm kind of talking about. You need to be a part of that fulfillment factor. You need to be the reason, right? That it has to be about you. So that is, I'm trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to say about fulfillment. That is fulfillment factor in a nutshell. It is everything. You have the ability to create not only an opportunity for the dog to enjoy and express their genetic desires, but if you can be a part of it, bonus points, right? If you can be a part of it. Now, one of someone had asked a question before about herding dogs and their fulfillment is to herd and whatnot. And how do I be a part of that? I'll tell you, my trick for herding dogs and being a part of that was actually um, done through play. And... I have multiple dogs, so it's a little bit easier for me, right? I could actually involve myself in starting and stopping play between dogs. That sort of an inserted some leadership over that play. Some, you know, my dogs learned to turn to me for direction when it came to play, but it also allowed me to be a part of it. It allowed me to be a part of the play. So now when my dogs are out together, if I have a dog's dog that's like everything's about the other dogs, I want to make sure at some point in time the other, that, that dog turns to me and says, are you coming to? If I don't get are the are you coming to look, I know I've got some work to do. I know I've got some work to do. And I'll tell you right now, full disclosure, I've got some work to do with Nike, right? She's my one-year-old Jack Russell Terrier. And um, she loves me. She loves hanging out with me. And when it's just her and I one-on-one, -on -one, we are like a unit. You know, she's like looking up to me and we're finding stuff and we're doing all this stuff together. But bring one other dog out. And she's like, they're more fun than you. <laughs> You're never going to be as much fun as another dog. So you got to try to figure out ways to do that. If you have any tips for that, please be sure to let us know. But that is fulfillment. 
the third and the final foundation of relationship love. So there you go. There you go. Now, if you haven't already gone to my website, beyondobedience.ca, on there we have a cheat sheet for you, Decoding My Dog's Behavior, where you can have all of these concepts, the foundation of relationship, leadership, leadership scorecard, the relevance gap, all of that stuff, fulfillment factor, all of that is there for you. So what you can do now is if you're having behavior problems, I'll tell you this, every single behavior problem can be, is, can be summed up in either one or a combination of these three foundational blocks. There's either a leadership issue, a relevance issue, or a fulfillment issue. For example, if someone says to me, I have a dog and they're being very, very destructive, they're ripping up stuff, they're chewing up stuff, they're like digging up my garden, they're driving me crazy, I guarantee you that's a fulfillment issue, right? We have to find ways to allow that dog to express itself. That's frustration, it's usually based in fulfillment. If we have a dog that is, you know, blowing off commands, not really listening to you, deciding like, nah, I'm not going to come to you this like right away, that's usually a leadership issue, right? There's a leadership problem there. See what I'm saying? So anyway, you can grab that. That's free for you guys um, on my website, www. I don't know. Does anyone say www anymore? Beyondobedience.ca backslash freebie you can get that there that's free for you hence why i cleverly named it freebie and hey you know what if you haven't already sign up for that newsletter on that website because that newsletter has podcast information it's got question of the week where your question could be picked and i'm going to send a video message back that's going to be featured on that newsletter as well as some other things we haven't figured it all out yet but we will and if you're not following me on the socials, be sure to check me out on TikTok as well as Facebook. And as always, get out there today and be the person that your dog thinks that you are because your dog thinks you're pretty amazing and so do I. Have a great week, everybody. I'll see you.